and I'm really happy to be here with um, one of my favorite authors in the world, Jorna Magna as well, one of my favorite people in the world. And uh, I'm really glad to be here with you out there who are watching and listening wherever you are in the world. Now, why are we here? Well, uh, we're here to celebrate the launch of Runa's latest book, Beyond Gender, The New Rules of Leadership. Now, I know that publishing a book is a feat on its own. Writing it is a feat on its own, publishing it, promoting it. Um, but getting someone to, you know, with such authority to say something like this is huge. So Dr. Marshall Goldsmith, who is the number one executive coach and New York Times bestselling author of What Got You Here Won't Get You There. Uh, I've got this book on my shelf and I'm sure a lot of you do. Uh, describes this book as an indispensable guide to visionary and inclusive leadership, transcending gender norms in an AI enhanced world. So that should tell us something. Um, the book comes at completely the right time and place in a world where we are looking at one of the most disrupt disruptive transformation in centuries, because uh, literally what we have been thinking of as normal today or in you know five minutes ago is not going to be seen as normal tomorrow or even later on today things are moving so fast to celebrate this book launch we don't only have Runa Magnus the author with us we also have five prominent leaders from five countries who I know that Runa has worked a lot with and have influenced her work a lot um, and they share their wisdom in the book however even if they're in the book, we are going to use this opportunity to dive in deeper into their profound wisdom. To give you a quick overview of how we're going to do this, um, first, I'm going to dig a little bit into the author's wisdom, give you a little bit of a taste of, of what you get in the book. And then we're going to invite the five thought leaders for a lively out of the panel, out of the panel, out of the box yeah <laughs> live discussion I should know that you go out of the box when you're with Runa because if you haven't read her book on boxes that's another one you should read so okay enough Runa yep. congratulations this is a huge huge thing um I'm so happy for you now here's the first question question why on earth did you write this book ah uh, yeah the question that I kept coming to in the process of writing this book, why am I writing this book? Should I continue to write this book? And each time that I asked myself during the process, there are two things that just came up and they are directly linked to my core values in life, being freedom, that if I find it extremely important that I can be free to be myself. And in order to do that, I have to let other people be free to be themselves. And I truly believe in freedom. And I think we are, so many of us don't have the opportunity, don't see even beyond anything, yet alone to just envision what it could be to free yourself from the social construct that you've been, we're, we're all part of, we're all into that, that bit. So freedom is not my number one. And then the second one is to be of value. It is extremely important for me personally that I feel that my life is of value. And I also find it extremely important in the in any interaction that I have with other people in my life, that they somehow find their value, that they somehow see that they are of value. And I think those two things are the things that constantly came to me. And I think if I can open a crack and, you know, you and I, we're here in Iceland and we've had these earthquakes and volcano eruptions coming on and on. And I see this every time with Mother Nature, how Mother Nature is constantly showing us things. And then when what happens when 
earthquakes happens and cracks up and there's this, this volcano that comes. There is this new landscape that is created. And I think the same thing happens with us internally. When we, we feel we're of value and their crack opens and we open it up so that we can be free to be ourselves. Yeah, wow, that's uh, quite a powerful metaphor with what's happening at the moment. Um, yeah, freedom, I've, I've noticed for, for the many years that I've known you uh, is uh, how important that is to you and, and value as well. And I know that um, you definitely always give a lot, a lot of value. Um, now, before I go on to the second question I've got, I just want to let everybody know that if you've got any questions or comments or anything, please do share them in the comments be below the Facebook Live video. And I'll be monitoring that while Runa talks to our fabulous uh, leaders later on. Now, I've got one more question before I uh, move on and, and we introduce those uh, people. Now, we've been speaking about this book for years and the content of this book and I've been following along with you writing it and uh, and I know how passionate you are about the topic now I also know that you know you you took a long time to get it out you had like what four attempts to start writing it yeah. and you finally managed to finish it mm -hmm. Um, I know that you had a little bit of help from modern technology, which is brilliant, which is you to a T. Um, but instead of celebrating the milestone, you have said publicly, and I've heard you say this more than once, that you think that this book is the most boring book you've ever written. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that that is exactly why we're here. Why that? Would you say something like that? Here's the thing, Thorana, when... And I would love to hear it in a comment with, with people who are watching and listening. You know, when you've been really, really passionate about something, you've seen something for the longest time, you felt you wanted to share something and and you do that, you write it down, you, you, you get it out of your system, you know, you're, I'm fiercely writing and wanting to change things. And, you know, I'm going do, 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 do on my computer. And, and then you go editing, 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 editing. Then you get an, a, a professional editor to go over it. And you're again, you're going over it, over it, over it. And then finally, finally you get that copy in your hand that printed copy and you go oh i'm so excited and you start and you go, oh my god this is boring and for a moment there i literally felt like did i just have a tantrum was that just like me going Bleh! i just needed to Bleh! get it all out there and <laughs> and then thinking have I like, when I get a tantrum, you know, really when I get angry, I'm that person that I get angry and then it's poof, over, done. You know, I don't understand why people are upset. And it was a bit similar. But saying that, it's also the reason why I said this is probably my most boring book and why did I come publicly saying that is because I honestly believe the world would be a better place if we don't filter one thing to be the right thing to say and another thing to be the wrong thing to say. And I literally felt it was boring. And if I want to create some sort of connection with people that are reading my stuff, that are following me on social media or have signed up for my newsletters, I've got to be authentic and I got to be the one that Oh, you know, raises my hand and say, hey, this is what I feel and this is what is coming through me. Do, do you resonate? Is there something that you uh, know yourself? So that's the story about the uh, most boring book, probably. But the good thing is, I have had more than one person come back to me and say, who had had a sneak peek into the book, has been reading the book and say, you know, this is not a boring book. This is actually a funny book. And this is a book that is opening my mind. And that, hearing that, Thorna, that just makes yeah. my day. Yeah. Yeah, I can only imagine. Um, yeah, 
And I can attest to that. That is not a boring book. And I don't really think uh, anything that comes from you could be boring. Um, <laughs> I'd be very, very surprised. And I think one of the things is, you, you know, once you've been doing this for so long and you're so deep into it, you can't see the forest for the trees anymore. So uh, I can promise you that to us that haven't been in there for four years or five years or how long, uh, it is definitely not boring. It's very enlightening. Now, thank you, Luna, for your insights for now. I want to welcome our panel to join the call. Now, they're going to be appearing on screen gradually here. Um, Luna did one of her brilliant things, as she would have. Um, oh. we, have a, we have a mutual friend, which I'm sure that many of you know is well. They're called yeah. ChatGPT. We have a few um, friends that are, that are called Bard and various names. Um, and they got, uh, Runa got them to actually uh, give us the titles or the descriptions of these fabulous leaders. So we have their Thortis Loa, Thorhalsdóttir. Um, she is the Thor of leadership and the president of Reykjavik City Council. And she's here in Iceland where Runa and I are based. We then have Dr. David Paul. David is among Goliath for complex change, advising the wise. He is not as close to us as, Ro as uh, Loa is. He he's in Australia. So thank you, David, for joining us from Australia. I don't know what the hour is there, but great. <laughs> Nicholas or Nick Haynes is the kindness czar of leadership. He is the co-creator of the No More Boxes transformational movement with Runa and is based in the UK. We then have Bev Hancock. She's the Beethoven of Communication Symphonies. That's quite a title. She is in South Africa. And Mahmoud Samandari is the Einstein of Trust for Enterprise Transformation and co-creator of Soul.com, uh, born in Iran and currently living in Switzerland. So we absolutely have a, a global panel of experts here. Now, Runa, I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to leave this with you to uh, have a chat with your fabulous experts and leaders. And um, I can't Thank wait you. to listen. Just reminding everybody, please do comment and you know send questions below the video and I will follow along and we'll, we'll get those questions to these guys um, later on. Thank you so much, Thorana. And I'm just going to take over and... Um... First of all, to all of my panelists, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart to be part of um, our uh, my day and our day today. And I just want to go directly to one each one of you, and I have two questions for all of you. Uh, questions that are related to the insights that you gave me when I was writing the book, and I want to go a little bit deeper into it. So what I'm going to be doing, I'm going to go and refer to one of the chapters that I am including your wisdom into, and, I, and, and then I'm going to give you a little question there. So I want to start by turning to my good, great friend, Thortis Loa, or Loa, as I call her, and most people, I think, call her. Um, Loa, in uh, chapter eight, um, you that it's called the power of allies uniting for change it i started the chapter with a beautiful quote from you where you say gender equality starts at the kitchen table where open conversation brew ideas simmer beliefs and cook up a world where every voice matters and every heart is nourished now my question to you, can you share with us your experience using the kitchen table for this kind of conversation? And how has that affected your life, both personally and professionally? Because I know that you are full of wealth when it comes to that as a politician, as a business owner, and, and with your background. If you could do that, that would be a really, really valuable thing. Thank you, and congratulations with your book, Runa. And uh, what do you say? Uh, can I say that in Icelandic? Yes, you can. Celebration to the day. Well, uh, well, this concept of everything starts with a kitchen table is uh, something that I realized uh, when uh, a group of us, uh, among with you, Runa, we we uh, uh, started an investment group, and this was in two thousand and six, 
just a little bit before the crash, the economic crash here in Iceland and in Northern Europe and America. And so what we saw afterwards um, uh, was that women were not investing as much in the stock market. And we, we were worrying about that here in Iceland. So we had a big seminar on it and we, uh, we had some, uh, some, uh, uh, well, how do you say it? I'm sorry about my English now. Um, we we had some research done on how women were investing, and we realized that they were not vin investing at all after the crash. So we had a discussion regarding how, how can we uh, implement or, or, or getting them more to be active on the stock market. And we realized that it really all started back home at the kitchen table. And then it was really an eye opener because we have this legislation here in Iceland that has been growing and, and, and being implemented since the 1970s and 80s and 90s. That is really the groundwork of the gender equality in Iceland. But still, uh, we found out that even though we started all this in the 60s, 70s and 80s in 2005 and 6, uh, we were still having a, a different opinion on how to invest the family money or you know whatever, whatever little you had so men were eager to do it and they just did it uh, uh, when women just didn't think of it so we started to to we started implementing this idea that you have to start this at the kitchen table so pa uh, couples uh, need to sit down and decide if, if they're going to invest so this it's a little bit this is the beginning of what yeah. uh, why I like to refer to this, but is also because I am now in my second marriage, just to be very personal. Yeah. And but that that marriage started 23 years ago anyway. But what I did at that time, and this was referred to me by a relationship uh, consult consultant to do a relationship contract. Yeah. So 23 years ago, me and my new boyfriend at the time we did a, a relationship contract written down because I knew, and my my husband is an investor and a, a finance guy. You know, I know guys, they like to write things down and if it's written down and they sign it, they, they do it and they know it. Mm -hmm. So we did, we write down everything about, you know, kitchen table stuff, hard talk, who's going to do what, uh, what about work? What about finance? And what about sex? So it's all written down by the kitchen table. Wow. And you're sitting by the kitchen table right now? Or I'm just no, thinking I'm... if it's the same table. <laughs> I'm sitting in my office waiting for an airplane to fly to North Iceland. So I will have to leave you in a couple of uh, minutes. Yeah, I'm aware of that. That's why I... <laughs> That's why you came in first. But thank you. That is that's such a good one. And I and in my book, I I, I was inspired by your insights. And I gave I'm writing down. You know what type of a conversation can you have at the kitchen table, and then how can you make a different conversation that can then lead to a different results that are maybe based more on who we are and what we what we are passionate about in our lives uh, than the same old same old same old. Uh, gender role, stereotype role uh, conversation. Now, my second question to you, Loa, in the book, we discuss the balance and difference between gender equity uh, legislation and then creating space for people to lead beyond their gender. And then we were talking about the, the, uh, the actual outcome and often blurred by our unconscious biases that we're not exactly following up with mm -hmm. the legislation because of our programming, because of our, yeah, uh, what we're used to do. What do you feel in being such a, a prominent leader in Iceland when it comes to gender equality? What do you feel was the most significant legislation that created the most prominent change towards gender equality in Iceland? So we have uh, we have the gender equality law, of course, and when uh -huh. we implemented that, we have there are a couple of things that I want to draw out. First is a concept called positive discrimination that was in in implemented in Iceland in the nineties, which means and this had to do with my experience because I used to be a business owner, so I was I had uh, about three hundred people working for me. So uh, this the positive discrimination concept is that if you have lack of either gender in a workplace and you have two applicants and they have the same uh, experience, you take the gender that is lacking in the 
no, no matter how much you like the other way. This was frowned upon in the beginning. People were laughing, saying, oh, this is this is nonsense. But today it really is something that is quite normal. And it actually, uh, as you can imagine, in the beginning, it was, of course, women who were lacking at the workplace. So for 20 years, it was women who were getting positive discrimination. But today it has totally changed around. So yeah. people are now thinking about diversity, thinking about making the team and making sure you have all genders and all kinds of experience. So this has moved on. The second one I want to draw uh, out is uh, a parental leave for both parents. Mm -hmm. And both parents are obliged to take their share of it. They cannot transfer it saying, oh, I want to be home, you can take my part or something like that. So this was implemented in 1998. And I remember this quite well because I, I was a manager at the time, owning a business and hiring and firing people. And uh, before that time, we had mothers taking mother's leave or parental leave, but men not. But then in 1998, it was so it was uh, changed. So if you have a parental leave of a year, for example, so the mother has five months, the father, if I'm to, or, but either parents, no matter gender. So yeah. one parent has five months, one parent has five months, and then you have two months that you can negotiate. And this is all based on the concept that the child has the right for the two parents. And uh, I like your, your chapter in the book when you're talking about the unconscious bias, because we are also... Uh, often thinking of, of men are not loving and caring. And in 1998, the legislation knew that it was a nonsense. Mm -hmm. So uh, both parents equally good to bring up child. Uh, that had a social and la labor force, a side effect that really changed how we think. So I think uh, we have a lot of more, we, of course we have equal pay, we have equal pay uh, uh, certification for companies that are obliged to have an equal pay. They cannot uh, uh, exclude equal pay, stuff like that. This is all very, very important. And it's like the lowest part of the pyramid, Maslow's pyramid, if you think about that. But we've learned that uh, you have to have legislation and regulation to move things around. Nothing like this happens just because everybody say it's nice. Hey, let's have equality. It's nice. Yes. No, it doesn't happen. You have to regulate it. And then my final point, if I have time for it, Runa, is the kindergarten, how we've implemented kindergartens. Yeah. So by regulation now, kindergartens are the first level of education in Iceland. So people are obliged again to put the children into kindergarten and all the kindergarten and the, I know this might sound a little strange to around the people around the world but all welfare healthcare and education in Iceland is public there is no such thing as private this and private that it's all public when I say public I mean it's paid by the government or by the municipalities even though there might be public and private companies running it but it's not the people who are paying for their education. It's not the people who are paying for their kindergartens, more or less. It's not directly through their taxes. Yeah, always through their taxes. So, yeah. so as a parent, you're obliged to put your children to a kindergarten. And if you don't, uh, you will have a social service at your home saying, why aren't you? Uh, mm -hmm. This is the, the, the first level of education. So what this means really is that women and men go, both of them, quite high percentage in Iceland, go on labor uh, market. And that is really important for pensions and stuff like that. So, but yeah. I'm not saying that we are all done, far, far away. Yeah. And we've learned that uh, implementing, uh, implementation of new law and legislation takes 10, 15, 20 years. You have to have patience and directions uh, and don't, don't go off road. <laughs> Stay on no. the road. <laughs> no, no, I agree with you. It, it's absolutely how it is. It takes. It doesn't happen just by coincidence. It's a. It's a lot of work in there, and it's a lot of determination, a lot of focus, and a lot of uh, willingness to do things differently. Lo, I, I am. I am so pleased 
to that you did have the time to spend with us today, as I know you're on a way to take the plane to the northern part of Iceland. Thank you so much for your input there. Highly appreciate that. And I'm just going for the sake of keeping this running and, and keeping this going. I want to go to uh, the next one on my panel. Uh, my business partner and my partner in crime with the No More Boxes transformational movement, Nick, or Nicholas Haynes, or Nick Haynes, as I always call him. Uh, Nick, welcome to this special occasion. Oh, it's lovely to be here, Runa. And, I, and that is not me applauding myself. That was me applauding Loa. Uh, oh, can I just yeah. say congrats, congratulations on your on your new book? Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Oh, you I'm have still working on your, Oh, you're reading you you're reading another one. one. Oh. Yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah. I know that it's good to know that I have at least one person out there who is really my champion. Thank that. you for that constantly. Yeah. Nick, I want to yeah. dive directly to to your wisdom. Um in chapter 4 in the book, The Gentle Blended, I do share your wisdom in a quote that says gentle doesn't define our energies. Our unique blend of energies defines us. Social conditioning may whisper, but it is up to us to compose the melody of our true selves. I just love this quote, Nick. Can you tell us what do you mean by this? That our gender doesn't define our energies. Well, it's kind of in a way that kind of... Um... You know, you have this thing of uh, masculine and feminine energy. You take that as an example. You say, okay, masculine energy and feminine energy brought these two uh, two sides of the coin. And they have lots of associated meanings to them. Okay. Yeah. But the actual idea of masculine and feminine energy was a total social construct. It was a construct designed. I mean, the ancient Chinese designed... They changed yin and yang and gave it a gender in order to have a social construct to mainly suppress women. Yeah. And we've seen it out through the whole history. The Greeks did it so to get women out of so they weren't in parliament, so they weren't in be able to vote because mm -hmm. they're very feeling, very emotional. Law needs to be logic, so women can't be it. So there's there's basically social constructs around the whole idea of masculine and, and, and feminine energy. Mm -hmm. Um, and when we and and when we come to but when we come to Earth, we actually come with a blend that the ancient Chinese recognized. We come to a blend with five of uh, five particular energies, and each of them gives us certain qualities and certain questions. And you were talking at the beginning of the interview about your desire and love for freedom. That yeah. is a wood energy manifestation. And as many men and as many women have wood energy and a desire for freedom. And, and each energy gives us something we want to do, but none of them are based around our gender. Mm -hmm. um, but yet we have a whole social construct around a masculine and feminine energy to it and the associated mm -hmm. feminine energy. They're listening, they're caring, they're saying masculine, they're hot. Loa, who is so experienced in this world and has made yeah. such a difference in the world, just accidentally her brain said, well, you know what men like? They like to write things down. Yeah, Exactly. And, it's and just we just exactly, do it. I, I did all notice that. Yeah, we're just doing it all the time. I thought, yeah, yeah. And I oh, thought, you know what all men, are like, men out there who have never written anything down, thinking that something must be wrong with me. Yeah, yeah. So I think one of the real so in that quote was really trying to say that we have constructed this idea of masculine and feminine energy. It was mainly constructed by men to suppress women, but it has been adopted by both genders as a as a fundamental truth. And society then decides that that is true, and we then throw it out. And there are, when I there are kind of all these self help books and groups and stuff trying to get us to understand masculine and feminine energy, and it's just a made up construct. Yeah. Um, the problem with it is, it, it, we see that out in the world because it is there all the time. So we then believe it to be true. Just and it, and I think we're in a very difficult phase. I think we're the equivalent of. Um, they they worked out the world was round but to us it looks flat so how no no it isn't it's flat the world cannot be round but it is and it's so it's, there's a difference so i'm just trying to say that 
energies do exist they're not gen they're just not gendered based unless we choose to make them gendered based yeah. um and the idea of masculine and feminine energy there is a vast amount of investment gone into it as a concept oh yeah people just can't let go of it because they have invested so much in it um, yeah we have we, we have yeah yeah, yeah. my and and yeah I, I can we can go on and on about that one now i want to go to question two to you and it really goes into mm -hmm. the the quantum human in late in leadership in in the book mm. we had i refer to you and our discussions about quantum human our um being capable of simultaneously holding multiple perspectives from mm -hmm. your viewpoint what are the key steps leaders can take to cultivate this ability within themselves and their teams especially environments that are historically valued with all the divisionness that we're having and i mean oh this is complex but hmm. how can we see more than just black and white either or women or men okay um it is a it is a massively subject so i'll just touch on a little a couple of little yeah. bits on it um so if you if you have change happening it stresses us as human beings we get stressed by change we don't yeah. is it going to be a danger is it not going to be so inherently we become stressed etc um as soon as we become stressed we we often say okay i'm going to i'm just going to keep this really simple or i'm going to revert back to what it is that i know and so we end up with this uh, this black and white response or fixed thinking in some way because we are fundamentally stressed. So as leaders, what you have to do is you have to cultivate something different. You have to have a level of fitness so you are able to deal with stress in a, di in a different way. You have to be faster in your thinking to be to run away from the old thinking. Mm -hmm. You have to be fascinated by possibilities uh, and the ability to recognize what it is that's, that's value. So with that really kind of fit, fast, fascinated, it's just a very, it, I don't like the word agile because that has, that's been used in a different way, but it is a, a very flexible, fast way of thinking. Mm -hmm. But your fitness, both mentally, emotionally, spiritual fitness, will reduce down your stress and therefore reduce down your propensity to go into the past known or to, to, to be overwhelmed by complexity. The amount of leaders that are just overwhelmed by complexity and all these different things, and all they do often doing is going fixed for what they know and, and, and stuff. And then with our workers, we need to give them the freedom and the fun to self-express and stuff like that. And we need to be uh, a culture within, within the workplace that is resourced. And it's resourced so it doesn't put people under stress. Yeah. And it's kind and it's forgiving. So it allows us to make mistakes and to explore. Whereas if you're not doing that, then we get stress, we get discomfort, and then we will revert back to a stress-based response. You look at a dog when it is stressed, it snaps, it isn't open, it can't have open thinking. And the the field we're trying to move into is to work, move into a field of possibilities, the quantum field, and to have possibilities you have to be able to see beyond what it is that you know and yeah. have known. And that is scary and that is stressful. Yeah. So leaders need to do certain yeah. things. So anyway, it's... Uh, and, we're, and we're looking at that and in so many ways these days as we're, as so many things are changing with technology, with with uh, with the, the multiple genders, as we just if we look at that, you know, when yeah. we are, then our, our system is still in the old ways but everything is changing out there so yeah how do you with that thank you so much nick this was really and, and, and there's there's one thing just one thing we really okay. need to watch yeah please. is that that there are leaders out there yeah. who will use the overwhelm to create simplicity in order uh -huh. to gain value gain to position so watch out for leaders who paint a very simple black and white picture because they're just trying to set one against the other and get your 
you to feel comfortable by making things simple. And now though in the world, we have leaders who are making things simple to attract people towards them. Yeah. And they will lead the world down a path that is nothing other than destruction. Wow. Okay, so we need to be. Yeah. That, oh, sorry, sorry, that, one. that, that was a big one. That yeah. was a big no, one. No, I'm going yeah. to get back to your book now. You're going to go back to. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. You always manage to get, put some humor into things. Thank you. But that is okay. so true. To be aware yep. of of those leaders that we are, we are, we look up to, we listen to, that they are, if they are really giving us the very simple black or white, that we either or, you have to go this way or that way. Yeah, that is where we come in and our we yeah. have to check in with ourselves. How does that really feel? Yeah. And, and that's why you wrote the book, so we can all become leaders of that note yeah. and make those other leaders irrelevant and redundant yeah well that's the intent thank you that that's so good thank you so much um i wanna i wanna move from uk and to uh switzerland to Mohammed samandari and i want to welcome you particularly i know that um we've had I had such epiphany, well, I had epiphany with all of you when I was interviewing you, but I had that real, real soul connection when we had our conversation moment with, uh, in chapter 19, I wrote um, a little bit, just a tiny bit of what I captured with you, but that was, that's the chapter 19 is the title is leaving a legacy, lighting the path for future leaders, leaders. And I quote your wisdom when you say, leadership is not about one person at a helm. It's about nurturing ideas, steering collectives, and inspiring organization to flourish. You then say that leadership should be an all-encompassing force that values the contribution of every individual. This is a music in my ears. Now, here's my question. This might sound like a common sense, but it's definitely not a common practice. Can you explain why this you think this is important as we're moving forward, uh, not only through the fourth industrial revolution, but it really we're heading fast into the fifth industrial revolution where technology meets humanity. Uh, Runa, thank you very much for, for this invitation. And I uh, see that we have many things in common, but one of the nicest ones is that uh, you wrote the book for your granddaughter. And I participate in many of these events for my granddaughters. So <laughs> that is uh, that is uh, that is why legacy matters. That is why legacy is on our minds. Uh, I think there are several reasons uh, for for the for doing this beyond just common sense. But I think also to remind us that it has always been the case. You know, if you look at war movies, there is always a scene where the general or the leader gets on his horse and uh, gives a pep talk and an inspirational talk. Uh, and the purpose of it is to get them to boost their morale and get them ready actually to even give their lives, if necessary, for a cause. Uh, this is inspiring a community of people to flourish by reminding them of the untapped capacity that is in them. So this, this, this is not only for the fourth and fifth and other coming industrial revolutions. It is part of human reality. But it's, that old style had an assumption, and that assumption was the leader knew and the others did not. The leader had experience. The leader had, had been to wars before. The leader knew about strategy, knew about history. So it was almost a monopoly of knowledge, and therefore everybody looked up to the one who knew in order to benefit from that knowledge. That knowledge brought power with it. But 
what society has done now with the advances that we have with innovation and large scale access to knowledge, that monopoly has been eroded. The leader is no more the one who knows everything, it's not the repository of knowledge. And that is why access to knowledge is the right of every human being in our time and participation in its generation, application and diffusion is a responsibility that all must shoulder in the great enterprise of building a prosperous world civilization. And each individual will do that according to his or her talents and abilities, because justice demands universal participation. Now, uh, I can compare the process of the evolution of societies to that of a human being. At the beginning, it's just a seed, then a fetus, then a baby, and eventually a mature being. Its needs, capacities, and challenges evolve over time. Mm -hmm. This has happened in the style of leadership also. A child needs the parents to lead, preferably by example, but at the as the time goes by and maturity approaches, parents need to create the conditions for children to exercise more and more agency. It is then that children will start to co-create with parents. And in the same manner, the leader does not need any more to know everything, but create the conditions for the team to discover what is needed. Because we do not know what is needed. We have to discover. Yeah. And that is, I think, also the one of the big challenges of our universities. They don't know what to prefer students for because by definition, the future is unknown and more than in the past. Mm, love that. I love that. That is such wisdom in that. Yeah, thank you. Um, in my second question, um, in the book, Beyond Gender, The New Rules of Leadership, I share your profound wisdom around ethical leadership and building trust. Can you tell us more about that concept and how you see that being one of the vital rules in leadership moving forward? Well, uh, first of all, I, I would not engage in a theoretical conversation about the definition of, of ethics, but in a very practical one. I think ethics is about coherence or balance or equilibrium, whichever way you want, or even harmony, if you want to look at it that way. And this is because in practice, we are never confronted with a fact in isolation. It's always in a context. One simple example, in Colombia, after 60 years of war, the government came to an agreement with the FARC in order to create peace. The fundamental value or principle the government had was to reach peace as fast as possible. When that agreement was put to public approval, it was denied because the fundamental value that people had in their mind was justice. So it's easy to talk about peace or justice individually and in abstract. The complication or the ethical aspect of it comes when you put them together and you find the right balance, the right coherence. So we are living in a world where coherence can be found at all levels, starting with individuals. Are we living actually the question in a world where there is coherence within individuals, institutions, and communities? I guess not. So what we need is to do a little bit of rethinking. So the ethical aspect of it is to rethink a number of things. For example, definition of success. Isn't our definition of success a one-way materialistic approach even when we do evaluation of people in the in in the office at the end of the at the end of the year? We look at their sales, we look at their contribution to profit, etc. Yeah. But there, there is a simple way to look at it differently. We can evaluate people, not based, as we do in football, not based on the number of goals they made, but the goals they assisted. Yeah. It's already done. It's a little change of paradigm that you refer to also. A little 
nudge in our way of looking at things in order to move from an incoherent black and white, as it was just said, in the box or out the box, as we also have had many conversations with you and Nick uh, that I immensely enjoyed, but looking at it in a slightly different way. And, you know, uh, also referring to the quantum uh, uh, multi-level multiverse, uh, actually, before going to such complicated things at quantum, I would like to, us to remember that we live in a multiverse world from the day we are born, most of us, because we have two eyes. With one, we do not see depth. So the fact that things are not either or, but a combination of things that are put together in the best way is also in the physical reality of how we see things. Mm -hmm. Now, coming to trust, trust is something that I need to develop within my organization by first being trustworthy. This is what we have seen. I have seen in my organizations and I've seen with organizations with which we work uh, at Seoul. It's all about creating the conditions again. I come back to that. The conditions for others to develop their capacity. If they have the opportunity to develop their capacity, trust will emerge because they will realize that this is the best contribution to what they need to do. Each one of us need to develop our inherent capacities. F listening, fundamental question of trust goes hand in hand with listening. Again, the problem of polarization that, you know, just, uh, you know, you simplify things, as Nick just said, because people don't need to listen. As soon as you open your mouth, they know what you're going to say. They know it is simple and they know that you don't need to think. And therefore, developing the capacity to listen. And finally, not to be too long, I'm sorry I'm taking too much time. Yeah. Finally, the capacity that we all need to develop is to challenge our assumptions. Yeah. If, we manage, if we manage just to start with an effort, and it can be learned over time, it's a practice. It's a yoga of breathing, <laughs> okay? Either we all breathe all the time, but we want to breathe better. We take yoga courses or others. Uh, let's imagine ourselves every day thinking of one challenge of my, uh, one assumption of mind that I want to challenge today. That will create trust around us. Oh, I love that. And yeah, the our assumptions. Holy moly, they are endlessly. Thank you so much. That is so good. I want to move from Switzerland to South Africa. Bev, my beautiful Bev, um, you, your wisdom that I share in chapter five, liberating the language, speaking a new dialogue, you share your unique story about how you paved your way as a single mom, learning as you go, as you said, building, using building powerful conversation that made you actually one of the top coaches in Africa. And I have my my first question to you, Bev, is around the language um, evolution and leadership. In in the book, uh, you highlight language critical role in leadership and transformation. As we navigate through evolving um, the societal and gender norms, how do you see language of leadership itself evolving to embrace a better? and uh, reflect these changes. Oh, you are muted. Sorry, there we go. There so go. I, I think the conversation so far has been, been fascinating because there, there already is a complexity that we're dealing with is how do we still bring simplicity into what is a very, very complex world and a very complex environment that we're, that we're working in. And I think this is the, the place that I've loved leadership language, leadership conversation, because it really is about being able to bring down, Mahami, what you asked the question, if we ask the question, testing a assumption, you can do that in one conversation. It is part of a bigger tapestry that creates a, a, a more complex and a deeper and richer conversation. I think, though, that from the language perspective, though, in terms of evolving our language, I think that 
we at the fundamental belief of the work that I do is that we have the power to speak our future into existence, which means that we are putting in leaders' hands a incredibly creative or an incredibly destructive tool. And I think that leaders, as they become conscious of the role that they are playing in an evolving future, they need to be very, very aware that 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 saying um, "sticks and stones may may hurt my bones, but words will words will never harm me" is just so fundamentally untrue. Because we because we have the power to speak love, we have the sp power to speak humanity, we have the power to overcome overcome complex change in the work in in the work that we do. And I think in the gender conversation, and I think really coming from South Africa, where I think. We have a very complex social structure and social norms. I think in Iceland you've been you've been very privileged to be able to have quite a strong systemic support. You've got a you've got strong voices in government. You have strong a strong desire to not only make legislation but to bring legislation into being. And the conversations around our kitchen tables would be very different because there's a lot of complex complexity and intersectionality and um, combinations of power and who brings what into the dynamic. So I think two powerful things for me um, that leaders can bring into this conversation. And funny enough, um, I don't think Dr. David is going to remember this, but he actually gave me probably one of the most powerful leadership tools that I use every single conversation I have with leaders is that if your leadership conversations are going to achieve anything, they have to be able to either evoke or provoke the brain into thinking differently. Yeah. I have no, you have no idea how many lives and leadership journeys that that particular statement has um, impacted. The other one, and it deals with this duality between simpl simplicity and complexity, which is something that I've struggled with for most of my life, because I tend to like the complex, is that we need to move from this duality, this either or, to both and. And therein lies, therein lies the simplicity. And if leaders bring that into a conversation, it's a one thing, but it's a one thing that opens up such a beautiful conversation. And I think in the gender conversation, we need to be moving from the either or to the both and. Don't do away with gender. I love being a woman. I love being pretty. I love being beautiful. I love being having compliments paid to me. Um, you know, I love my girly space, but I also like to to have really, really vital conversations with males, with females. Um, and funny enough, many years ago, and this started my journey on the gender construct, is that I was told I think like a man. Yeah. And I've, I've spent many years unpacking what that means. Um, <laughs> and the, every time I do an assessment, I come out with a very strong male, male thinking, all right? Um, and it's really stimulated some powerful conversations, which, which has brought me to the fully human space, is to be able to say, how do I access the fullness of who we are? And how do leaders do that to get the best from their people? I love that. I love that. Really, really good. Now, my second question is around impactful communication strategies. Considering your expertise in the power of your words and conversation and leadership, um, what are some of the most impactful communication strategies you believe leaders, and then I am talking about us leading our lives just as much as leading a, a, an organization or a group of people, that we can adopt that dismantles the outdated gender norms and foster a culture of inclusivity and equality? So three that come to mind. I think the first one is understand the importance of the inner conversation. The oh. conversations inside our heads dramatically impact the conversations that we have with others. And I've really seen the power of this in one of my clients this week, where I gave him in our last coaching session an image of a pause button. And I said to him, next time you go into a difficult conversation, because he's very triggered by people who don't, who don't show up properly, who don't do what they're supposed to be doing. He's very personally triggered by him. I said, I'm giving you permission to take this in and to push that pause button and to quieten down your inner conversation. 
Tell me what it does for you next time. In one, in one very short space of time, it completely transformed how he showed up in a conflict disciplinary based conversation. So at a very, very practical level. So your inner conversation that you bring into every interaction that you have um, will determine the quality of the conversation and the leadership presence and the ability to listen and the ability to open up the future in every single conversation. I think the second element is, and this really focuses around um, the both and, is to be able to look both left and right. If we take something around how how important is gender to, to, to us in our organization, if we look right to the future and we say, how will a more equitable gender conversation, opening this conversation up, serve our organization, serve our team, serve the, the well-being and the health of our of our, em, our employees? And that is a very positive conversation. Mm -hmm. I think, though, in order to, and I think this is where we're missing out, we tend to become so passionate about stuff we don't look left to say, how is it not serving us? Yeah, yeah. Where is it holding us back? Where, is, where are the limitations of, of me loving my identity of a woman holding me back from being able to explore my fully human contribution that I bring to the world? So mm -hmm. that look left, look right um, exercise is very much brings the the the, the skill of reframing, and I mm -hmm. think that's that's that that's the, the 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 such a such a powerful conversational tool. To give you to give you a really great example, if you fall in love with the problem, it means that you see problems differently. You can you can you can circle the problem. You can stay with the problem. You can love the problem. And then all of a sudden, it brings in a whole different level of perspectives. It gives you time to bring those, those perspectives into place um, and to really be able to work with that. And then I think the, 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 the last one for me is around this willingness to hold. We hear win-win. It's a very, very fab. It's a, it's a really popular concept in business. I'm not quite sure that win-win exists because in order for us both to win, chances are we both have to give up something um, in order for us both to feel that we're winning. Both and thinking in a conversation says, can we hold both without giving up how we feel about it, without giving up our perspectives? Is there a place to hold both in this conversation? And when we do that in a in 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 a convers in in a conversational environment, we are able to experiment one conversation at a time. And by bringing by seeing a conversation as a as an experiment rather than a fixed place in time, rather than a brick, it's something that you can try. If it doesn't work, you calibrate. You try again. If it doesn't work, you calibrate. You try again. So it brings that agility that you were talking about, um, Nick, and I agree with you, agility is a very overdone word, um, is it brings it down into the little building blocks. And referring back to what you said about my, my, my experience as a single mom and the journey that I've taken, I have to remind myself to turn around and look back mm -hmm. because a journey is made up of those thousand steps and you only appreciate the steps when you turn around and see how far you've come. And each one of those steps can be a conversation. That's beautiful. That is so true. And it brought you here. It did indeed. And who would have thought when you and I first met all those years ago? Exactly, which is another, another conversation. Thank you, Bev. So impactful as always. Either or is not the thing. It's it's really, it's going above that. What if, what, if, and, and that question, if we could go from but to and just in the conversation, just that change alone, oh my gosh, so that will be a, a big change. I can, yeah, uh, exactly. Now, moving to our final speaker and one of my dear friends um, and mentors, uh, in my life, uh, all the way to Australia, uh, Dr. David Paul, 
I, I believe it's probably around midnight new time now. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for being with us. I, I want to start off by referring to chapter seven. The title of that chapter is Navigating the Gender Obstacle Course, Overcoming Challenges with Grace. And that I share your wisdom where you say, embrace the power of small shifts with every choice, every step, you're molding your mind like a sculpture each small change shapes new pathways, leading you towards the boundless realm of self-discovery and transformation. I absolutely adore that quote of yours. Now, my first question is uh, around mindfulness and leadership and um, decision-making. Um, David, in your discussion on mindfulness and its influence on leadership, how do you think mindfulness practices can alter the neural pathways associated with decision-making in leaders, especially when confronting gender biases and stereotypes. Gosh, can we put away our timepieces and bring out our calendars to answer this question? <laughs> uh, because measuring time by minutes or hours is not enough for this question. But let me start with asking just a self-reflection question. Would you allow a 12, 13, 14 year old kid to drive a car in the middle of New York? Just say yes or no inside your head. Would you get on a plane? So let's just pick an A380, which is kind of one of the latest jets that transport passengers around the world would you would you trust if the pilot said to you i've only had one day's training and i'm going to fly you to the other side of the world would you trust that pilot no. and would you get on a um a space rocket going to the moon and the leader of the the team says Thank you so much for coming with us. We're just taking a trip to the moon. By the way, I've only had a week's training on how to fly this thing. Would you get on board? I don't think so. If, if the answer is yes, you need to come and have a session with me. <laughs> because, <laughs> because you would be mad to get on any one of those kinds of transport if those people were operating it. So why, and by the way, each of those licenses to, to fly, to drive, to pilot these things costs from hundreds to thousands to millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a thing sitting above on top of your shoulders called a head, which houses the brain. And my question to you is, this brain is the most complex thing in the known universe right now. Most complex. Why do we not have a license to use this thing? Why do we trust our leaders to lead us when I can't see a, a license for them to use their brain? I don't trust the way they use their neural pathways. And in a way, it it's the mess that they create because they don't know how to use it. And in a way, you know, I'm oversimplifying this because, you know, this I'm just summarizing like seven years of study into like two minutes. But, you know, there are there are simple brains, there are complicated brains, they're complex brains, and they're chaotic brains. So why is it do we trust major world decisions or corporate decisions or business decisions to people who don't even have a license to know how to use their brain? So the question is very interesting. <laughs> how do you create neural pathways? Because it's those pathways, because we don't know how to use them properly, that we get into this mess of 
stereotyping, gender biases. Did you know that just just in terms of just your brain, you have about 175 different types of cognitive biases? Yeah. Never mind emotional, social, psychological mm -hmm. uh, types of And by the way, they run into the hundreds. Aren't, yeah, I'm just giving you just one. Yeah. But just to every day we combat at least a hundred different biases. Wow. And yet we don't know how to overcome them. So how do we really deal with decision making and leaders? It is to me, num the number one is I would get every single person above the age of 23 because that's when the brain is fully formed under the age of 23, they're still kids, children or kids. Um, but I would put them through a truly challenging kind of educational process. So they develop things like heightened self-awareness to mm -hmm. deal with their biases. Mahmoud, wow. um, Bev, Nick, You've all talked about this, but the second thing that people need is this idea of how to practice what what I would call enhanced empathy. Hmm. Not just empathy, because everyone thinks they're empathetic, but they're not. But let's just play with this for a moment. Yeah. It, it's to really understand this this multi multi billion dollar instrument that's sitting it is which is worth way beyond 10 billion by the way to create it right now but to really help them develop this and the third thing i would say is really teach leaders and bev mentioned this so beautifully and that is be open to diverse perspectives I mean, the technical term for that is neurodiversity, uh, and that's more complex. But but helping people realize that different perspectives mean a much better solution to a problem, as opposed to the same old perspective, which gives us the same old answers, which takes us back another 30 years mm -hmm. in our thinking and behavior. Because unless we have an increased openness to diverse perspectives, we will go back to gender biases, stereotyping, and a very, very sadly, a narrow-minded and judgmental attitude. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Wow. Talking about going deep. Oof. My, my um, second question to you, David, um, what well, you're really saying that why well, how mindfulness can really help us in this process integrating mindfulness from from your perspective how can we how can mindfulness become more effectively integrated into leadership development programs to enhance emotional intelligence empathy and inclusive thinking Um, I think I need to put you through med school for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, uh, but very quickly, I think it's about really approaching this whole question through a, more of a holistic approach um, because mindfulness gives leaders, um, and, and Mahmoud mentioned this earlier, and that is, we measure success and um, and organizational success, leadership success, really by by profits at the moment. We haven't really made the commitment to move beyond that. We talk about it, but it's it's again, it's another neural pathway that has yet to be created. Uh, but the idea of mindfulness is all about helping people realize, that unless we understand the neurological basis for what we understand as mindfulness, we are actually not going to change very much. 
because people talk, people say they're mindful or they practice mindfulness or they practice meditation or practice a whole range of things, but you see no changes in their behavior. Mm. And you can spot, and I mean this in real terms, you can spot probably, you know, a hundred meters away, I was going to say a mile away, but a hundred meters away, uh, a person who says they practice mindfulness, but by their behavior, you know they don't. Yeah. So what is the key to this? And that is the whole idea of mindfulness thinking, mindfulness training, mindfulness programs is to help people realize we as one humanity can change just by dealing with this notion of mindfulness, understanding it, incorporating it into our education. Mm -hmm. And that way people will feel so much better because they know what the brain is actually doing as opposed to guessing what it does. And, you know, if I chopped you at the neck and then say, go and go to work today, Go and change your behavior. Have a different attitude. Go and have a different conversation. You won't. You can't. Your yeah. brain, your, your heart might be beating, but your brain will be going, gosh, what do I do? It can't live on its own. And one of the most exciting things about uh, brain research is that the brain loves to change every single day. Mm-hmm. And it's our biases, our, our gender biases that actually prevent us from change. And one last thing I'd like to say is if, you, if anyone listening is finding this difficult, I would say just improve by 1% every day. So very quick, very quick example. Let's say, let's just say you don't exercise. Well, tomorrow, get up in the morning and walk around the bedroom. Just do it once. Mm -hmm. The next day, do it twice. Yeah. But the one thing that the brain needs to understand is that consistency eats perfection for breakfast mm -hmm. and i'll leave it there i love that starting with that those small steps that yeah. small change that allowing yourself to do things differently so that your brain lightens up and creates new pathways for something new to emerge into that is profound that is profound thank you thank you thank you thank you so much i i just want to say before thorana comes in here and tells us what's happening online um on on the on facebook um to all of you uh from really from the bottom of my heart thank you for being part of this journey thank you for all the work that you are doing in the world to um create uh, a bit more human world uh, to create a uh, space for us to grow. I, I use the phrase to become better, bolder and brighter as the leading light in our lives. And all of you are doing that in one way or another. So thank you for that. And thank you for sharing your wisdom with me and our audience today. Thorana, are you still there? Will you pop in? I am. I am. Wow. That's, uh, I have to admit that I will definitely, definitely be watching this back because there was just so much in there. Um, and I can't, can't wait really. Um, yeah, it was illuminating. So, so thanks, Runa. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, I've been monitoring the chat online. I've actually had a few PMs as well. Um, and uh, there are a 
couple of questions and just a couple of comments and a few comments that I'd really like to highlight highlight a little bit. Um, we could take ages, but um, the um, there are some concerns. Well, Guido is talking about that the inner conversation might also determine what we hear in the conversation that, you know, not just what is actually being said, which I think is is very, very interesting. I think we we can't ignore that. Um, and Carolyn is saying, you know, it which relates to that, it also comes down to trusting our own internal governance and guidance, being more discerning and trusting ourselves. So there's a there is a, a theme going on here. I think that uh, you know, they're spot on with the fact that, you know, letting you yourself be the guidance rather than listening to the environment all the time. Although, of course, we need to be uh, aware. Um, I have a couple of questions here. Um, in the book, you delve into the role of AI in shaping the future of leadership. Um, could you share with us a little bit how AI can be a tool for enhancing self-leadership and help leaders uh, go beyond the traditional gender roles? and uh, build and foster an environment where everyone can thrive based on their unique abilities rather than the boxes that you you can uh, you've talked about so much yeah um i i can i can start with that i would love your insights as well you guys um what i have been doing and i talk about it a little bit in the book as well is i've been combining the the knowledge from from and the wisdom from from Nick with the five energies and vitality test. Uh, I've been using that myself with my clients um, where I, I get the insights from who is this person? How do they see the world? Which really the outcome from the vitality test tells you. And it's not only shows my clients how they, how they see the world, this also shows them how the world sees them. So I've used chat GTP to help me um, analyze their profile and help me go deeper into, you know, I want to, I want this, I want to help this person do something X, Y, Z. And, and AI has really helped me uh, by just sharing, this is their profile. This is how much they have in water, in wood, in fire, in earth, in metal. And then with my question, they go, well, here's the thing that might be their, their blind spot. And so with my one-on-one -on -one clients, I've done a lot of that and they found it uh, incredibly insightful for them. I even, when I help them with their big vision and they have some big visions that they want to achieve, they want to see themselves in the world. And I say, and I ask, you know, can you help me? What will be the thing that will most likely be their blind spot? What will be the thing that was, will most likely come up as a fear for them not moving forward. So from just, this is something that I know that Nick could have done because he's he's a wizard in this. But, and even though I have a direct link to him, I, I mean, he is a busy man. I can't constantly be asking him. Plus, I, I know that his wisdom should be out there and really should be something that people have access to in the sense of they can use this platform for their teams. I've even used this for teams that I put, multi, you know, like complex things, like a whole team, 10 people. And I've given AI information about those 10 people to say, tell me about the, what are their strengths and what are their weaknesses and how can they communicate better? And bloof, voila, I got it. So all of those things, I think uh, AI can really help us at the same time. AI was created by certain, you know, originally talking about the seed that we talked about earlier, was created by some wisdom with some biases behind it. So I have to be really careful when I'm doing this, that I teach my AI, that I teach my chat TTP, how I want to communicate, how, who I am and how I want chat TTP to help me with and, and clarify for me so that I can share my wisdom in the way that I know it's me in that sense. That's where I think ChatGTP and other AI still can really be helpful. But at the same time, like all of us have shared that it's that thing of stopping and just checking is that is that being, 
you know, am I being biased here? I, you know, knowing now that I probably always will, but just that looking at it at a second glance and what am I, what am I, how can I go deeper into this? Yeah. It's a real helpful thing. What about you guys? What are, what do you say about this? You know, maybe if I could pop in here, it's, it's something that I've given a lot of thought to. I was I was comparing the the term conversational intelligence in a technology in a technology context and a human context. All right, and and I actually asked ChatGPT this question, and I think therein lies the um, the power of how we use it. It lies in the quality of the questions that we're asking, and because technology is using such deep language models. The old age principle of garbage in, garbage out still applies. All right. Um, whatever you feed in is going to come out the other side. So technology is essentially going to scale. It will scale stupidity. It will scale wisdom. It will scale whatever it is that 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 you went. <laughs> David, I see you laughing. Um, and I think that I've watched a whole lot of people rush to business models and they give you prompts. And it's actually, to, to me, we're not using technology as it can. because So what I've been doing is that I've asked ChatGPT a question. And then I think about the answer and I think, mm, let me ask that question from a different perspective. And so I think it is a, it is a really, really phenomenal tool. But I think the power of the question and the understanding of how that will scale both our own wisdom and influence and the wisdom and influence of others um, and the perspectives that we bring in is something we have to be deeply self-aware of. I think going forward, the future trend that I'm seeing, you know, they say a picture paints a thousand words. Mm -hmm. The big step up in generative um, AI now is how we are creating visuals. I mean, Dale E and all of the, I mean, every every graphic package has got it built in. So now it's what are the words that are creating the picture? It's almost kind of like flipped that concept on its head. Can we language a business, a, a, a picture into 3D? I see Dave's got his hand up. Let me hand over to him. Uh, um, I agree with Bev, um, and a very quick way to deal with ChatGPT is, you know, when at the bottom of ChatGPT you get, um, uh, did you like this answer, were you happy with this answer mm -hmm. kind of symbols. I always go into that. I always say, no, I'm not. And then there's a drop box that says, why not? Why aren't you happy with it? So I actually told Jack. Chat GPT or the programmers to say this is a gender bias response or this is not a creative response or this is not so I'm kind of educating Chat GPT to understand that it needs to go broader or deeper or think differently because I always say this is such a stereotypical answer so mm -hmm. it's, it's a really nice way and a very quick way to teach it. Um, to, to, to expand and, and, and to also to, to change the way it's using language because uh, Bev is an expert on language. So you'd want, you want to get it right as opposed to just accepting what it says. So yeah, uh, Ahmed's going to say something as well. So I'll pass it on to him. Well, you, you said it better, David. Uh, it is up to us to educate ChatGPT to be what we want it to be. And if I compare it also the question of a child growing, it's it's a newborn baby. Uh, it has it is tapping on existing stuff which is totally biased. And if we want to uh, uh, balance it somehow, we have to put a lot of input into it. So rather than complaining about it, we have to come collaborate to improve it. Yeah, really, really good. Yeah, exactly. I think that's spot on. I uh, yeah, picked up a few things there that I really want to just highlight. Uh, first of all, Nick, um, talking about being replaced by AI, are you a bit scared? <laughs> uh, just kidding. Um, of course, AI won't be able to give the same insights for quite a bit of, a bit of time. And and like you said, there is the, the bias. Um, I do want to mention to people if they haven't done the vitality test, 
Google Vitality Test 5 Institute. It's uh, very useful. Um, for me, I found that it helps me both understand myself and others. And and I love how Runa is talking, using ChatGPT to deepen it. She's told me about this before uh, and promised to teach me a bit more. So I'll be holding her to that. I suggest a blog post. Uh, I think that would be useful for us, and I think it would uh, be very enlightening. I'm thinking a blog post from Dave, from Dave and David and Bev and and Mahmoud uh, as well. But uh, um, I think I just want to highlight again: technology will scale stupidity and wisdom, and 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 that's uh, that's both scary and a huge potential. And uh, I think we'll all definitely be taking from this that, you know, to remember that we can educate the AI. It's not, for example, just open our AI that can, you know, now they've, they've said that they are going to work on it to because it's become lazy to get it to to work a bit more. Um, so that's great. But we can do this as well. Um, I th see we're out of time. There are questions here that uh, I think, you know, I'll share with Runa afterwards and uh, she'll be blogging a lot after this. And I hope you guys will as well and share it with us to make sure that we can share it in the context of the book and the work Runa is doing and, and you guys are all doing, which is absolutely phenomenal. So I just wanna say thank you everyone. I'll leave the last, last words with the author, but uh, thanks for letting me and I'm sure that I can speak for everyone. Be that you know thank you for letting us be part of the re re the revolution um and i can't wait and i'm sure uh, again you know we all can't wait to see how the book will transform uh leadership beyond gender um i also love that runa uh, is passionate about sharing this message as widely as possible and she is a phenomenal speaker i think you know those of us who have seen her on stage can attest to that so i encourage everyone who's watching and listening to get in touch with her the contact details will be shown on screen later on um to whether it's invite her to speak or continue the discussion in in some way um, and you can reach out to her at runamagnus.com slash contact. So Runa, will you round this up for us? Yeah. I think there comes a time in all of our lives that we go through change. And right now we're going through a phenomenal change. And there lies an opportunity for all of us in that space to look at who do I want to become and what do I need to do? What do I need to stop do and what do I need to do? And who do I need to become to be that change that I want to see in the world? And I wholeheartedly believe in our power to do so. So with that, I want to thank everyone who's been with me and with us on this journey um, for taking the time to look at things internally and look at how it can become uh, the leaders that lead by the new rules of leadership beyond the binary. Thank you. <laughs>